Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to the last lecture of the Havana mini session, and I guess the last lecture of the whole conference. Um, so I'm here to tell you the tangled tale of Havana homology and to tell you a little bit about what is this whole business of categorification actually about. Um, uh, how can you think of it? What can you categorify? How can you go about trying to categorify things if you want to? Um, so here's a slide that I probably should have given you on Monday. Okay, but um, here we are. So categorification existed in mathematics. It's just not under this name. Um, and I'm sure that as I explain it, you'll probably come up with examples of your own of categorification that just were not known under that name. Um, but it was introduced by um, Louis Crane and Igor Frankel and later popularized by Joy Barnatan and, and Mikhail Kovanov. And the idea is um, the following. So I'm going to give you like a very, very simple example because, you know, I don't know a formal definition. So it's sort of going to be um, a definition by example and kind of not all inclusive. So if you have a, a natural number, can you think of an, I mean, of course the answer is on the, <laughs> on the slide, but can you think of, a, of an algebraic structure that's sort of uniquely determined by that number? And, you know, between vector spaces, you only distinguish them by dimension. So once you tell me what's the dimension of a vector space, I know exactly what that vector space looks like, and then you can pick your favorite one as a, as a thing. So, so categorification in this case would be coming up with a vector space V whose dimension is N, and the space can be anything. And then how do you decategorify? Sort of if you have a space, how do you check that you know you get the right value there? Well, you know, you compute the dimension of your vector space. Okay. Not a very enlightening example, but but you can ask, so what can I do now? So I've replaced an in, uh, a natural number with a vector space. So what? Does anyone have any ideas what we could do? What can we do with natural numbers? Everyone knows the answer to this question. Count. Um, add, multiply. Okay. So can we lift those operations in this setting? Because, you know, having numbers that you cannot add, you know, it's, no, it's not much. So, yes, and there's like natural operations of vector spaces. You take a direct sum that lifts the sum of two. Um, natural numbers, and then again, the categorification is taking the, the dimension. And indeed, the dimension of a direct sum is the sum of dimensions, so everything works out, and the same with the tensor product. Okay, what else can we do with natural numbers? We can subtract them, but then we leave the class of natural numbers because we can get a negative number. Okay, and that's an issue, right? Because I don't know of any vector spaces of negative dimensions. Okay, <laughs> if you know some, let me know. <laughs> okay, so how are we going to deal with lifting this operation to something that maybe works with vector spaces, but, but it's something more than just a class of vector spaces? Okay, so we can lift it to a category of chain complexes, and you've seen quite a few chain complexes. So how does that work? Well, let's say that V is a vector space of dimension N, and let's say that W is a vector space of dimension M. I'm going to give you a very, very short chain complex, zero, and I'm sorry there's like many, many errors here. So this is the chain complex. Zero goes to V, goes to W, goes to zero. And then, of course, the tricky part is coming up with the differential, but we should not worry about it yet now. And then there's like another piece of information. We want to put V, which is the measure of N, in the even degree, and W in the odd degree, because decategorification in this setting takes the form of the Euler characteristic. And then whatever it's in the even degree comes with minus one to the even power, so it comes with a plus sign. Whatever is in the odd degree, comes with a minus one to the odd one, so it comes with a minus sign. So the Euler characteristic of this short chain complex is precisely n minus m. Okay, great. So that means that we can 
lift subtraction. Okay, but now that we went from category of vector spaces to category of chain complexes of vector spaces, we have to rethink everything that we've done so far. Okay, and I'm going to do just that, okay? So <laughs> instead of just lifting n to a vector space v, I'm going to lift it to like a very, very short chain complex. A zero goes to v goes to zero. No maps, nothing. Make sense? Okay. But then what happens with the addition and multiplication? Well, actually, there's, there's equivalent notions of taking a direct sum of chain complexes, which is what you think it should be. You just take direct sum of spaces, and you take all of the maps kind of acting on their domains. And then there's a slightly more complicated um, tensor product of chain complexes, which sort of just says that whatever is going to be in um, degree p sort of comes from um, adding up, and this should have been capital V, um, uh, taking the spaces from constituent chain complexes whose degrees add up to, to P. And then, you know, there's some details on how to define the differential then, and but it's basically like just the taking derivative of the first one, tensor with the second one, and then there's some sun issues, and um, this should have been a differential. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, which operation are we missing? Yeah, so we're missing division, but that sort of means that we're going to go from the space of integers to space of rational numbers. And that's actually something that, to the best of my knowledge, no one knows how to categorify. Okay, so there's various ways, if you have rational coefficients, there's various ways of getting around it by sort of observing in the combinatorics and um, a most recent archive paper claims that um, uh, his collaborator, Tian Yan, um, Yan Tian, have categorified Z adjoint one half. So you can sort of deal with dividing by two, but that's about it. Okay, um, so that's a wide open problem. But so what can we do with this construction? Um, so, and, and how does it work? So if we have, um, positive integers, we have vector spaces or abelian groups, I'm just repeating now, and decategorification is computing the dimension. Or if you don't want to work with vector spaces, you can work with groups, and then you take a rank. So just the free part. Um, if you have integers, then you take chain complexes of vector spaces, or again, groups. And then decategorification takes a form of computing the Euler characteristic. So how does that work? You take that chain complex of yours, you compute its homology, and then the requirement is that if you take the Euler characteristic of that homology theory, it's equal to whatever you've started with. And then if you've taken algebraic topology class, you sort of must be thinking to yourself that if you're just thinking of not just even any topological space, but like a CW complex or a simplicial complex, and you may remember even from like middle school computing the Euler number of a polyhedron, which is just the number of vertices minus number of the edges plus the number of faces. That's the number. And then in the case that you've needed to prove that, you probably have done it in a combinatorial way where you sort of say, well, each edge has two endpoints, and then, you know, each edge is incident to two faces, and so on and so on. So it's a lot of combinatorics that sort of goes into proving that. But in topology, it actually comes for free because all convex polyhedra are just spheres. And their homology is going to be the same as the homology of a sphere. And therefore, they're all the characteristics have to be two. They have to be the same. Okay, any questions? Okay, so singular homology, for example, I is a, an example from standard theory of algebraic topology. That's an example of categorification. The theories that I did or did not talk about yet, um, that uh, categorification is a link homology theories in, in knot theory and graph theory, um, all fall into this example, right? So Hovanov uh, and, and the theory that I mentioned briefly, Higert floor, then the chromatic homology that I've sort of briefly described, this combinatorial, the category has the chromatic polynomial, they all fall into, if I compute the Euler characteristic of a homology, I'm going to get the polynomial back. Okay, so what I've just sneaked uh, here is that actually you don't get just the number, you get the polynomial. Okay, but remember my example in Havana. Homology is sort of like, if you decategorify, if you compute the all the characteristics just of the row, that gives you the coefficient of the Jones polynomial. 
and then this q to the j just sort of keeps track of the powers of the variable in the Jones polynomial. Okay, any questions so far? So I'm going to like switch gears just a little bit now and, and sort of try to relate what I'm talking about to a uh, temporary Lieb algebra that Lou told us a little bit about. And I want to tell you that that algebra is not lonely among um, el algebras with planar interpretation. So for example, just a group algebra of the symmetric group, um, which is just generated by transpositions, can be visualized in this way. So transposition that switches i and i plus one is a generator and you can just present it diagrammatically as, you know, switching the two lines and everything else is the identity, okay? So this means that you're dealing with the, with a permutation. One goes to one, two goes to two, and the only two that are changed are these. And then you, for example, know that if you compose transposition with a transposition, you should get identity. So how do you compose here? Well, you just stack two of these together. I'm going to do an example in a second. Okay, well, here's the temporary Lieb algebra. It's generated by things that are called U sub i's and are drawn this way. So instead of the cross um, the transposition, you have the smoothing. Okay, and then the rules are that, you know, again, U squared is minus Q squared plus one over Q squared, and I'm missing U sub i here. Okay, so the relation should have been um, ui squared is minus q squared plus 1 over q squared times u sub i. And the reason why this minus here is in different color is because that's the missing sign from the first lecture, in case that you were wondering. I just <laughs> forgot to put it there. Th so that was Lou's observation. And then this says that sort of like far away things commute, and this guy says that if you combine close the ones that are close by, you get the one back. So I'm going to do an example. So let's do temporary Lieb algebra on three points. Um, so um, I know that there's Catalan number of them, and um, you should sort of feel free to convince yourselves that that's the case. Um, so how many different um, guys can we have? We can have these three strands that just go through. And then you can have one strand that goes through and these two returns. Or you can have a picture that's symmetric to that one. And then I have another pair of elements, the ones that sort of go this way or this way. Okay, so these are generators of temporary Lieb algebra on three elements. And again, what's the multiplication like? So let's, for example, take this guy. And uh, maybe this guy, I don't know. Okay, so we just stack them on top of each other. And I probably switched the orientation. You should stick to one, either top to bottom or bottom to top. And you sort of see, well, you know, this line we are topologists can be straightened out, so that's just this guy. Okay? Make sense? Okay, any questions? Okay, well, what's kind of, uh, you know, a feature and a bug of temporary Lieb algebra is that you have to fix the number of endpoints, which kind of let me sort of like foreshadow things a little bit, just means that you can work with tangles that have, you know, two n endpoints only. Well, there's a way to work, th there's a way to sort of work around that restriction. And again, let me, I, I did mention this before, but let me tell you about the category of temporary leap category, something I'm going to call temporary leap category. So I'm going to say that the objects are non-negative integers, so just a collection, I'll represent it just with a collection of points on a horizontal line. And those points are going to be fixed. So, for example, um, let's have, I don't know, four. And that's the object I'm going to call four. And then I can have an object I'm going to call two. Okay, great. Those are my objects. What are the morphisms? 
Well, morphisms are pictures, <laughs> okay? So morphisms are planar diagrams that have, well, four endpoints on the top and two endpoints on the bottom. You, of course, consider them up to isotope. You can take linear combinations of them and over something, and, you know, I can, let's say, draw, let's say, this one. Okay, and then, of course, what can happen when you, when you compose these morphisms, and again, composition is given by just stacking them on top of each other, what can happen, for example, is that if you start with um, uh, this guy, and let's say you compose it with, whatever, this guy, what you're going to get is a circle in the middle. Well, a circle in the middle doesn't fit into the description, but basically uh, it's the rule from temporary algebra that tells us how to get rid of it. So the circle just evaluates to minus <laughs> Q squared plus um, one over um, Q squared. So this picture is going to be equal to minus Q squared plus one over Q squared. By the way, is this big enough for the people in the back? Okay, awesome. Uh, times, um, a guy that um, just looks like, oh, sorry, this is completely wrong. Um, let's, let's do this. If you compose them, <laughs> that's like a very important rule. When you compose them, they have to have um, the same number of points in the middle. So theoretically, the composition of these two guys would have been just zero. Okay? Because this guy is a 4-2 tangle, and this guy is, uh, and they should have the same parity, so it should be 4-0 tangle. Okay? And you cannot compose things like that. So if the number of endpoints in the middle doesn't match, the value is 0. <laughs> okay. So let's do another example now that would actually work. So, wow. Okay. Um, so let's have two endpoints and have six endpoints and then have maybe four endpoints here just to make things more complicated. And let's say okay. Okay, so I have these two guys. What's the result? Well, this one is just going to get isotoped to a little return on the top. And these guys are not affected in any way. And then this guy here is going to give us multiplication by minus Q squared plus 1 over Q squared. Okay, everyone has at least some idea of how this works. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, again, I'm talking about this as a, as a category, but ultimately we, we do like to work with algebras if we can. And actually that can be achieved, well, at a price that your algebra won't be as nice as some of the algebras that you know and love. So this temporary leap category on n strands, let's first actually observe that um, if, if you um, sort of um, want to see the algebra, temporally algebra on n strands, that's just a, a, a space of homomorphisms between, um, you know, fixed number of endpoints on top, the fixed number of endpoints on the bottom. So the way that you see temporally algebra, which is on endpoints, which is something we started with in this big construction, is just as a space of maps between n endpoints on top and n endpoints on the bottom. Okay, so that's good. But then you can turn this category into an algebra. But you see, this algebra will not be unital. It will not have a unit. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you have a, if you have a temporarily lieb sort of algebra, let's say, on four strands, then um, you have a unit element. If you compose this one with any other element of the temporarily lieb algebra on four endpoints, you're going to get that element back. Okay? But precisely, uh, because of um, non-matching things here, there's going to be no one unit, right? Because, for example, if I want to attack, um, um, let's say, something that has 
um, six endpoints here, and maybe just two endpoints here with this one sub four, what's going to be the value? The value is going to be zero. So we don't get this element back. So what's going to happen is that we're going to have a so-called orthogonal idempotence, one for each n greater or equal to zero. What does that mean? That, that for each n you're going to have, um, you know, just a diagram that has n through strands going. So theoretically, if you want to work with infinite things, you can just add all these one sub n's together and they will act like a unit because one of them will get the element back and everyone else will invert it at zero, but if you don't like to work with infinite things. Okay, so what does it mean that they're mutually orthogonal? Well, that means that if you want to com um, combine the one on three elements with the one on, let's say, five elements, the result is zero. So one sub three times one sub five is zero. So they're orthogonal. Okay. Perfect. And then, um, in particular, again, let's just have in mind that, that this temporary lib algebra is nothing else but the sum of all temporary leap algebras and on fixed number of elements and then on like all possible fares, pairs. So sort of somewhere here n will be equal to m but then we get much more. Okay, well what are the categorification examples? So categorification is of course not restricted just to not theory or graph theory or something but it sometimes takes different forms, okay, that are maybe more advanced if you're starting with something that's more complicated than an integer, okay? So what we kind of talked about so far was like lifting integers to abelian groups or to vector spaces, okay? But maybe something that you want to categorify is already a vector space or it's already a group or it's already an algebra. And then you want to lift that to something, you know, more sophisticated or just more involved. And uh, that's, that's what I've denoted here by sort of like a billion groups are lifted to a billion categories. Well, you know, if you have a ring, then you sort of need, will need the multiplication extra. So if you know a little bit about category theory, that means that you need a monoidal category on top of it. Okay, um, but you know, this has been done. It's been very successful. I'll tell more about connections a little bit later. But for example, um, Hovano and Lauda in their series of papers starting with SL2 sometime in like 2007, up to you know now, they have actually categorified quantum groups. That's like really, really important and maybe an important step in actually categorifying uh, Rishitik into Rav invariants and, and sort of getting invariants on three and four manifolds. Uh, and then there are various algebras that have been categorified. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm leaving off, you know, very, very, very many people out of this list and I apologize for that. Um, but, um, I am going to be slightly selfish here. Um, I'm going to actually show you diagrams that are from my joint work with Mikhail Kovanov that sort of look like tangles, right? Um, they can be thought of as tangles, except that we don't distinguish crossings, right? And um, it's definitely not a temporary leap thing because there's crossings everywhere, okay? Um, but, you know, uh, the same way as, you know, I had a homework for you to convince that there's Catalan number of um, elements in temporary leap algebra. There's actually, um, if this is n n points, if this is m n points, there's n plus m minus one, I think, double factorial. All possible matching, all possible matchings here when you don't avoid crossings. And then you can sort of try to undo things. So first you say, I don't want to have returns here. And then you say, no, I don't want the long strands to cross. Anyways, there are all these rules that we can sort of impose that sort of sometimes kill topology, but you know, it's fine. So actually this is combinatoric, sorry, combinatorics or diagrammatics. I like to call it diagrammatic calculus that was used to categorify Hermit polynomials. So whole class of orthogonal one variable polynomials. Okay, so if you wanna know about it, that's like my um, kind of example where you can sort of um, categorify something that's not necessarily just combinatorial, that comes from analysis, comes from an inner product and, and so on and so on. Okay. So again, categorification is not restricted to polynomial invariants of knots and graphs. That's, that's sort of the main takeaway from here. Okay, so back to tangles. Um, Actually, there's a way to view tangles as a 
two category. Um, so what does that mean? That means that you have objects and you have maps between objects and then you have maps between maps. Okay, and let's see how we're going to visualize those. Okay, so we already know how to start. Objects are points, okay? I mean, non-negative integers. So you may have no points or you may have some number of, positive number of points. And then um, what I've represented here is, is, um, is a tangle, right? Is a three, five tangle, okay? So that's a one morphism, okay? So that's, that's a map between three and five in this case. And then you can imagine that if you put a tangle here and put a tangle here, and I'm going to do an example on the board in a second, so I'm just deliberately being vague here, you can have something that's called a cobordism that's going to be a surface that's going to have this tangle in, a, in its boundary in the front, the other tangle in the boundary in the back, and then it's going to have like a number of um, top strands and bottom strands here and sort of some sort of cobordism, some sort of surface in the middle. So let me try to make this a little bit more precise. Um, so let's have some number um, of points and um, so what's, what's a, I'm going to start actually with something that's simpler than this that has no crossings. So what I'm going to define for you here is a flat tangle. And a flat tangle is just going to be a collection of um, um, arcs and circles properly embedded in R2. Okay, so maybe I draw something like this. I always do this, okay. So it's up to, and then maybe I can add a few of these. But notice here, I sort of stopped myself, but now we can actually do things like this. It's not an issue. They can cross. Okay, now what, so, so again, the reds are my objects. The greens are one morphisms. And now let me tell you what will be the two morphisms. So I'm going to have a tangle T1 in the front. And I'm going to have a tangle T2 in the back. And let me sort of try to make it sort of somewhat simple. Okay, so this surface that, again, has four number of endpoints here and here, and then these tangles in the boundary, plus it lives in in this sort of, whatever, um, R2 cross, sorry, um, I cross I cross I, for example, or R2 cross I, and then you, you need to sort of have these lines included here, and these guys here. But then in the meantime, you're going to have to have some saddle cobordisms to turn this tangle into the other tangle. So this is what I'm going to call S, and this is my two morphisms, two morphism. What can you do with all these morphisms? So you can compose them, okay? How do you compose one morphisms? Well, we kind of did the planar algebra thing. It's, it's, it's the same thing. So the way that you compose tangles is that you can just sort of uh, stack one tangle on top of the other. But in order to do that, let's say if you had a tangle with K, M, and N, they both have to have M and M and points here, one on the top, one on the bottom, in order to have a non-trivial composition. Okay. 
However, notice that with two morphisms, you can actually combine them in two different ways. And I'm going to do it sort of in, in somewhat sketchy way, <laughs> okay? So, for example, you can have tangle one and tangle two and a cobordism S1 between them. And then you can have tangle three and another cobordism S2 between um, T2 and T3. Then basically if you compose S2 with S1, you're going to get a cobordism from T1 to T2. Okay, make sense? Everyone? It's like a composition of maps, right? However, you can do the following thing. Uh, you can sort of use this kind of picture. So you can have a tangle T1 and T2, and then you can have tangles T1 prime and T2 prime. And then, of course, the number of endpoints here has to match. And then you're going to get, um, um, so let's say S1 maps T1 to T1 prime and S2 maps T2 to T2 prime. Um, if I draw them like this, because let's say these guys share um, let's cer say certain number of endpoints here, then these two cobordisms will actually share that many straight lines, that many uh, one one uh, manifolds. Oops, the wrong one. And what you're going to get here is something I'm going to call S1, S2. It's going to be a map from T1 composed with T2 into T1 prime composed with T2 prime. Okay, everyone with me? Somewhat? Okay, this is a two category that we can use to categorify things. And I'm just going to do that for you now. So, uh, basically, um, there's no, n I mean, there's a good reason to try to categorify or sort of come up with a homology theory um, for tangles. So number one, um, when you're defining Havana homology, it's sort of defined globally on a knot diagram. So you somehow have to know the whole structure of it in order to compute it. But I mean, you can always split your knot or link into a bunch of um, tangles and you know, here we actually don't even have to specify um, whether there are two tangles or, or some other kind of tangles. So somehow if we could define Havana homology for tangles, then we could have some sort of local theory for computing Havana homology, if it, if it becomes related to this one. So, um, well, I guess the other reason to do this is, is because not cobordism can be actually really nicely understood by thinking about cobordisms between tangles. It's like splitting into your pieces. They're actually called frames, and then you get movie moves in case you're interested into looking at those. It's, it's a lot of fun. Okay, so um, how are we going to go about categorifying or sort of constructing Havana homology for tangles? Uh, well, we're going to do it in two steps. So we're going to do Havana for flat tangles. And then we're going to sort of expand it into Havana homology for all tangles. So let's see, what are my objects? My objects are integers. My one morphisms are tangles. My two morphisms, well, let me denote flat and let me denote cobordisms, but flat. And if I'm going to categorify things, I sort of need to start with objects. And I guess if I say that I want an algebra, none of you are going to be surprised <laughs> about that. So let's see, how can I um, get something that I'm going to associate to the n endpoints? 
Okay, again, this is a construction by Havanov. Um, so let's consider two endpoints on a horizontal line, so the way we had it um, before. And you can sort of think of it as, as um, also if you don't like this picture, you can sort of think of it as just having um, some sort of tangle and even an oriented tangle sort of attached to it. Okay, this is just a two tangle. And let's say that BN is a set of crossingless matchings on these two n points. Um, so I guess here's my example for you guys. If I have, what is this? So let me keep the convention. Three. Um, here are all of the possible guys that I can have. I can have this one nested and then I can have this guy in the end and you know I leave it to you guys to fill in all of the guys in between okay, maybe I'll draw one more okay um, and then let's call these elements let's say A and B of B N but if the rules are like this so how am I going to combine them okay well it's a very natural thing that I can define I can sort of define a reflection along the horizontal line. So reflection along the horizontal line. So for example, if this was my element B, then omega of B would just look like this. Okay, and the way that I'm going to define the product, well, it's going to be actually a omega of B. So let's say if this guy here was A, what am I going to do? I'm going to put well, my six endpoints in the middle, A on the bottom, reflection of the B on top. And inevitably, you're going to get some number of circles. OK, and then the TQFT tells us that you should associate some, some algebra or some structure like that to whichever circle we see. So basically, what's going to happen now is that by definition, I'm basically what I'm doing, I'm sort of applying a, a TQFT to this. So for every n greater than 0, I'm going to define h upper n to be a direct sum of over all elements A and B in the set of crossingless matchings, um, F of omega B composed with A. Where again, F is that functor that associates some A to a circle. Okay, so in this particular case, what you're going to get is that F of omega B A is going to equal to a. Okay, so um, I actually claim that this HN is a ring. Okay, so again, addition is, is sort of easy to think about um, because you can just take formal sums, but if you want to um, add these guys, sorry, multiply these guys, any ideas of how that should be done? or where the multiplication is going to be coming from? Well, sort of as usual, multiplication is going to come from topology, okay? So, mm, 
ring multiplication um, comes from, let's say, having um, A omega of B and again B omega of C. If you don't have omega and B and B in the middle, you say that the multiplication is equal to zero, the same as we had with our algebras before. And um, so let's just have a certain number of endpoints here and certain number of endpoints here. Okay, and let's have the this guy here, and let's say. Sorry. Okay, so in this case, I sort of um, had B equal to C, which is probably not a great idea, but I don't have much choice, so let's leave it this way. So what am I going to get here? Um, I want to sort of um, have a map that has just these guys on the top and then a collection of straight arcs in the middle. So basically what I want to consider here, I want to consider a cobordism that goes from these guys to these guys, I'll call it S, that sort of just undoes everything that could have happened here. And what's that going to give me? Well, I'm going to have HN here, and I'm going to have HN here. And again, here, I'm going to get another copy of HN. So what that gives me is HN cross HN into Hn, and that's what my multiplication does. Again, product is zero if you have anything but omega b and b in here. Okay, and um, maybe just to give a quick example, what would be b1? b1 are all possible matchings that you can have on two times one points. So you have only one element, a. And you can only do one thing to it. You can compose it with a reflection of itself, in which case, if this is an element A, then A times A, which is going to be A combined with the reflection of A, is going to be this guy. So what is the ring H1? It's the sum over all possible possibilities, but there's only one possibility, and there's only one circle. So is just equal to A. So in this case, B1 is particularly simple and just inherits multiplication from, the, from this one. Okay, so I think uh, when I'm working on a board, I'm, um, I'm going sort of like horribly slow, um, which may have been a good idea uh, in one of these days. But um, here's sort of um, where I sort of wanted to um, get to. So this um, ring HN is what I'm going to be assigning to my objects. And then let's see what's a natural thing to assign to a tangle. Okay, so basically, if you have a flat tangle, like, you know, whichever one that we had before, maybe that middle one over there, uh, basically what you're going to assign to it is... Uh, um, if it's a N M tangle, then you're actually going to assign H N H M by module. And again, if you're not familiar with these terms, don't worry about it. It just sort of says that you can act on things this way and you can act on things the other way with depending on the number of endpoints. And then and then this is easy. So we already did all of the heavy lifting when we decided how to do this. And again, this is natural, just based on the algebra action. If I want to ma map topology into algebra, and I've already assigned that I'm uh, by modules to tangles, then the maps between tangles should go to maps between by modules. So basically, there's no choice here. You're going to have HN, HM, by module homomorphisms. Okay, and I'm almost done. Somehow, um, well, almost done, meaning 
that now if I want to work not with flat tangles and flat tangle co co um, cobordisms, but I just want to work with, well, object is still n, and I have all tangles, and I have all tangle cobordism. How's categorification going to look like? Well, let me do a very, very simple example for you. Here's like the simplest um, non-flat tangle that comes to my mind. It should be oriented, I'll skip it. So what do we do when we see a crossing? We smooth it. Okay, so let's just do that. We can get rid of this crossing in two different ways. So one way would be to sort of do the vertical smoothing. The other way would be to do a horizontal smoothing. Okay. And then, well, we sort of know what to expect, right? Because in, again, even in Hovano homology, we know that whatever we associate to this should somehow depend on these two. Um, well, you know, um, it's going to be um, f of this and f of this will give me f of this guy and then I'm going to fit it into a very short chain complex here. Okay, again, in order to take the factor of this you need to take all possible closures on top and all possible closures on the bottom, assign an algebra A to each circle we did that whole week so you know how to do it. Okay, and that's the whole story, okay? That's how you get categorification of um, tangles. Oh, well, in Hovanov style categorification of tangles, of course, this is not the only approach. Um, I will like to recommend yet again um, two survey articles and lecture notes by Paul Turner, one from 2000 and one before 2010, one from 2014. The second one is called Hitchcocker's Guide Through Hovanov Homology or to Hovanov Homology. And um, it's, sort of, it's a very conceptual, very well broad overview with like extensive list of references to all of the things. And, and I did do sort of definitely want to refer to it in here. Uh -oh. um, and the other thing is that um, basically, even if you don't want to, uh, you know, iteratively build your knot out of a tangle, like this tangle and that tangle, maybe out of crossings, well, you can just think of this as, well, if you have no endpoints on the top and no endpoints on the bottom, what you're going to get is not a link, right? Because there's no boundary points, you can only get closed components. So, you know, if there's nothing here and nothing here, all you can do is sort of draw your circles in the middle and those are knots and links. So, um, again, thi this, this theory does encompass um, Hovanov chain complex and Hovanov homology in it. Minus all of the details that I've skipped, of course. And, um, and uh, you know, what's of course really important is that if two tangles are isotopic, then the assigned complexes will be homotopy equivalent, which is a notion of equality among chain complexes. In particular, that means that their ho Hovanov tangle homology will be the same. So chain complexes may be different, but homology will be the same. Okay, any questions? Yes. Yes. That's right, so, so I suggest, uh, n not necessarily, you, so for example, I, I sort of like would encourage you to, to find a structure on H2. Okay, so you're going to have sort of four endpoints, and then um, let's see, what can you do? You can have these guys, you can have, well, there's only two elements. So you don't have too many possibilities, right? There's going to be four of them, and it's going to be, um, so let's see, which one? So if you combine this guy with itself, you're going to get, um, oh let's do it very quickly. You're going to get this guy, so this is going to be a tensor 2. Uh, of course, if you combine this guy with itself, it's again going to be a tensor 2. 
And then if you combine them together, I'm just going to do one example, but there's going to be two contributions, right? Because it's symmetric. Um, um, let's say this one, there's only one of them. So it's going to be, so H2 will be direct sum on of all of these guys. And then it would be interesting to actually deter determine how does multiplication work. But um, anyways, other questions? Okay. We're going to tie up some loose ends that are very, very, very tangled. Okay. <laughs> so um, I have um, 10 minutes to tell you all about things that I did not finish talking about in the second lecture and um, some of the generalizations of Hawaiian homology and applications. So let's first pick up where we left uh, off on Tuesday. So on Tuesday we discussed Lee's spectral sequence. You know, it was introduced by Lee. It was sort of further uh, worked on and maybe better uh, understood by um, Jake Rasmussen. So there's a spectral sequence whose second term is Havana homology, which sort of converges to Lee homology. And um, remember, um, if it's a knot, Havana homology is thin, and it just converges to two copies of Z, or if you're working over sorry, of Q, or if you're working over Z, two copies of Z, if you're working over ZP, two copies of ZP. And it also additionally gives us uh, the night move pair, okay? And night move pair really looks like a night move, and then over ZP can look like something else. Um, and again, this was that boring theory that um, towards the end of my talk, I sort of quoted Barnatan, who says that it's very interesting how non-interesting the, the theory is. And uh, that's because it actually turns out that every actually page of the spectral sequence is a leak link invariant, which is awesome. And then only two generators survive. Those are the generators of you know, these two copies of Q. And it turns out that they're always in a homological degree zero. Okay, that's good to know. And it, it you can sort of uh, prove that always that they're in, in sort of neighboring degrees, which means that because we skip every other, that means that the difference between them is two. Okay, so you can divide them by two because they're both odd or both even. And it turns out that this is exactly what the Rasmussen invariant is. You look at the computation of Hoanok homology, you look at the degree zero, you see where these two z's are. And you say, okay, they're in minus three and minus five. So Rasmussen invariant of a two five torus knot is minus four. As simple as that. Okay, well, I claim that it's invariant. You don't know that, but yes, it is. Um, and I mean, it kind of follows from everything that I've said. It turns out it's a nice invariant. It's a zero for the unknot. It's additive under connect sum. Taking a mirror of a knot just changes the sign. It's a concordance invariant, which means that all of the knots that are concordant, I won't go into details of that, they have the same thing. And then there's something that's called the slice genus. So it's the minimal genus of a smooth surface that's smoothly embedded in a four ball that has a knot in its boundary. So it's a very, very geometric property of a knot, and it ends up being bounded by from below by the Rasmussen invariant. Okay, well, again, this is amazing result, but in particular, it it was used by Jake Rasmussen to actually prove Milner conjecture that's actually known as kronheimer mruka theorem. They've proved it using gauge theory. And somehow the proof, I can just sketch the proof now for you, you can actually prove that Rasmussen invariant has a very nice form if you're looking at positive knots. And torus knots are positive knots. So you only need to know how many crossings you have and how many circles in a homogeneous smoothing and you know, here's your S invariant. Okay, great, and then you compute the S invariant, and then you say, okay, great, slice genus of a torus knot is what Milner thought it should be, which is just one half of P minus one, Q minus one. Okay, well, what else can we do? Um, actually, there's other invariants that can be um, approximated or bounded, or that you can say something about. So there's um, work on like thurston in number and uh, by Shumakovich, Plamnevskaya, and, um, and Lenny Ng. And then, for example, you can also get obstructions to thin feelings and so on. If things, these words mean something to you, then now you know the Havana homology can maybe tell you something about them. And, for example, there's like a, a very nice result by Ellie Grigsby and Yini 
that uh, says that you can actually um, distinguish between braids and tangles using a version of Havana homology that Ian can tell you more about. Um, and then um, uh, there were questions earlier about what can Havana homology tell us um, about links. Well, actually, it can give us the lower bound for the splitting number. So it can tell you how many, if you have a link, how many, cr what's the minimal number of crossings that you have, cha have to change so you get so that you unlink your link. Okay, so you get just n component link that, that are not together. Uh, by the way, this is a result from 2013 and involves yet another spectral sequence, um, in case you were wondering. Um, of course, Havana homology can detect the unknot, and that's a fantastic result by Mrovka and Kronheimer that again involves a spectral sequence, this time from a special version of Havana homology to again a special version of Heger floor, well, not floor homology, it's called instant of floor homology. And um, and here's like a curious result that's um, somewhat related to what um, one of our groups in Havana session is working on. So Matt Hadden and Yini proved in 2012 that Havana homology actually can distinguish two component links from a two component unlink. So sort of equivalent of di distinguishing the un, not just in the word of two component links. Well, um, Jones polynomial does not. It's actually a paper of Eliyahu, Lu, and Morvin Tisselthwaite where they have actually produced an infinite family of knots and links, sorry, of n component links that have a trivial, they have whose Jones polynomial is the same as the n component unlink. Okay. Um, in the next three minutes, last three minutes, um, um, well, actually there's a multitude of polynomials and I'm sure that um, you're familiar at least with some of them. They have all been categorified and some in more than one way. Okay, so I guess there's a mother of all polynomials, <laughs> I guess, here. So homoplate PT polynomial, it's a two-variable polynomial. And then there's like various specializations for A equals Q to the N, and here I've listed the polynomials based on what's the value of the exponent. Well, they have all been categorified. So two-variable homoplate PT polynomial is actually categorified by a triply graded Havana Rosansky homology. So because you have two variables, you need an extra dimension. So that one lives in R3, not in R2, like Havana homology. Uh, well, there's nothing to do here. Uh, Alexander polynomial has been um, categorified by Krieger floor, not homology. And again, um, that's like a whole and amazingly active area of research. Um, uh, Jones polynomial has been categorized by Havana homology, and I've told you about various versions of it. But there's actually more. So there is um, a derived categories in cohe in of coherent sheaves construction by Kautis and Kamnitzer from, again, it's probably second half of after 2005, before 2010. And there is a result from, I think, 2005 by um, Paul Seidel and, and Ian Smith, where they actually use symplectic topology to construct Havana homology, but it's still not known whether it's still conjecture it's the same as Havana homology. Um, that we know, and then you can categorize all of the SLN polynomials. Uh, Havana Rosansky used matrix factorization. There's again a symplectic version that's kind of analog analogous to this one by Ciprian Manolescu. And there's recent results by David Rose and Hoel Kefalek that have like a really, really awesome description that doesn't deal with matrices, but deal with sort of diagrammatic objects that are called foams um, in constructing this. And there's, a c of course, colored link homologies. Okay. Um, relations and interpretations um, in a minus one, no, in one minute. Um, so relations between theories take form of spectral sequences very often. Um, and in particular, you can sort of see that Havana homology is related, I won't say how, to SU2 representations of the knot group. And again, that's part of instant for homology. So sort of, I think, for the people who are very knowledgeable, like Korham and Maruka, that was probably enough to sort of establish this amazing connection. Um, again, it's a very, very open question still. What does Havana homology really measure? Which knot property is it, is it, is it detecting? And one way to, um, to learn about it is to actually come up with a geometric realization. So start with a knot, come up with a space such that the standard homology of that space is somehow related, maybe the same to Havana homology of the knot. Okay, and um, sort of, if you want to sort of establish relations with homotopy theory, there's a fantastic result by Lipschitz, Lawson, and Sarhar that's a very involved and very um, beautiful construction where they have a, a certain homotopy type 
Um, and then there's other results by Everett Turner and actually Marithania Silvera and Josep Przetitsky in particular by degrees. And there's a fairly recent construction that's um, supposed to be um, related to Hovano homology, but also to the graph homology. So I am working with this on this. Hovano homology and physics, I'm sure there are people in the audience who know much more about this than I do, but I sort of did my best to provide some references. Um, so Joe's polynomial has a definition that, of course, I did not even mention in this talk. Uh, so it's a path integral in certain sort of gauge theoretic construction. It sort of relates to Chern Simons action. And um, I think that's sort of some of the basis of all these various constructions that sort of relate quantum homology to physics. So maybe I'll just say that. I guess Witten in 2010 provided an alternative construction of Hovano homology where he uses five brains. So it's, it's just amazing. Apparently generators of Hovano homology are just solutions of some five dimensional PDs. Okay. Uh, anyways, uh, but, but there's like many other results. Um, they've all homologic algebra of knots and BPS states and, and um, string theory. Uh, so with that, well, maybe just minus one minute over time. I would like to thank you all for a fantastic week. Um, I